Okay, well, thank you for joining the session about Rosenshine's principles. And I know I'm, I'm addressing a, a, an international audience, uh, a different types of roles in education. Uh, so you, I don't know how much people will know about Rosenshine's principles, but I'm going to give you an overview of, of what, what they are and why I end up talking about them quite often. And also share with you some ideas about the support package that, um, that I've been creating called Teaching Walkthroughs, which helps teachers implement the, the, the principles to sort of link the two ideas together. So uh, let's just start off by saying what we're trying to we do. We're trying to work out how, how to do this <laughs> teaching. It's complicated. And part of my job as a school consultant and trainer is I go to a lot of schools and visit, visit them and help them think about how to improve teaching. So last week, for example, I must have seen about 30 different teachers teaching and in, in a number of different contexts. Um, I'm just hearing someone say they can't hear anything, but is, is that OK? It works. OK. Um, and so across primary schools, secondary schools, high schools, um, further education, colleges, universities, even a number of different contexts teach through in a situation where they've got a number of different learners, students to teach. And you can watch someone who is highly effective, experienced, knowledgeable, knows the material they're trying to teach, knows the students, and seems to be working hard and trying lots of things. And still the student here is not sure what to do, the student here is struggling, the student here hasn't quite followed, can't remember what they did last time, can't explain the concept. And, and it's difficult to always notice that as a teacher. So we need some, we need to have a, a kind of a way of thinking about the problem of teaching so that we can support teachers to do the best they can in, in what are quite complicated situations. A lot of it comes down to the fact that when students are thinking, it's not visible to us and we need to generate evidence of what's, what they're thinking and learning in order for us to adapt our teaching so that we can be as effective as possible. We can't just deliver information and hope that every single student is learning from that, especially if we're not really confident their prior knowledge is as good as it should be. So what, how do we address this complicated issue? Well, of course, teachers are experienced uh, and experience counts for a lot. You know, you learn on the job and, and for forever teachers have been developing through trial and error you know working out what works adapting adjusting but also it's important to recognize that teaching is extensively researched there's a lot of studies done to try to find out whether certain techniques work whether certain approaches uh, have an impact and education research is a complex field because there are so many variables in a classroom I just go back to this picture here. The number of variables you're trying to control are significant. There's the material, there's the experience of the teacher, there's the prior knowledge of the students, there's, there's the, the time, uh, there's, <coughs> there's so many variables. It's very hard to tie them down. So a lot of, ex lot of studies into education are, you know, gives us, just give us insights. They never tell us what to do, but they do give some insights into certain things which we might call good bets. So in my work, I do a lot of uh, training with teachers and people often said to me, you know, what does the research say about this? Or what's a good way to get into educational research? And I found going back a few years now that I, when I, I, I was often, um, I was often citing various different books. You can see some of the ones up here. You've got Graham Nuttall's Hidden Lives of Learners, Visible Learning, the John Hattie work, Dylan, Dan Williams, Why Don't Students Like School, Embedded Formative Assessment, which is Dylan Williams, An Ethic of Excellence, which is a different type of, of study based on experience, really, from Ron Berger, and so on and so on. I found that what cut through a lot of these and summarised a lot of these ideas was this simple paper here, Barrett Rosenshine's Principles of Instruction. So you can, you can download this. I've just got a copy in my hand here. It's a simple PDF. And this comes from the American Educator paper 2012. So it's nearly... 10 years since this was published but the actual original work was published in a previous paper in 2010 and it really is a summary of Barrett Rosenshine's work as a cognitive scientist and researcher going back 
over many decades. And a lot of the studies he cites are, you know, go back several decades as well. And essentially what Rosenshine is, did in his work is they went into schools and, and said, you know, which teachers are getting good outcomes? Which teachers? And, and let's go and have a look at them. Let's see what they do. And let's see if we can codify those practices. And where are teachers maybe getting less good outcomes? Where are the least, less effective teachers in the schools? Let's go and have a look at what they typically do. And let's see if we can compare and learn some lessons. So that was his main, one of his main areas of research. But he also then looked at cognitive science, some studies to do with memory, and some other types of studies, for example, specific interventions around things like thinking aloud or scaffolding. And what he says is this, there are three different types of research, but there's no conflict at all between the instructional suggestions that come. So in other words, what cognitive science is suggesting works, uh, are good bets, seem to be the things that effective teachers are already doing, which is good news. It means there's no sort of radical um, revelation, which is, hey guys, you've all been doing it wrong, you should be teaching like this. Teachers who've been good at instructional teaching are, are typically doing the things that he suggests. So what are those things? Well, he, in this particular paper, he's condensed what started off as a list of about 17 things into 10 for the purpose of this article. And then what I found when I was writing about this and, and presenting it, that there are four main kind of groups of those things. And I've presented them in this poster made with my colleague, Oliver Caviglioli. So essentially, what, 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 is, what did Rosenstein find and what is he suggesting? That effective teachers spend a lot of time reviewing materials, so making sure previous learning is consolidated, daily review and weekly and monthly review. So the idea that we don't just keep going on through a curriculum, we, we take time to consolidate and check prior learning has happened. We ask lots of questions and check for understanding. We'll talk a bit about that. So, and he suggests that teachers who invest a lot more time checking for understanding are more responsive to the student's success at any given time and can move faster forward or go back and reteach. And that's a really important part of a good teaching process. So immediately it gets away from the idea that instructional teaching is one way traffic. It's implicitly interactive. So you have to find out from students how they're going in order to be effective. These three things, sequencing concepts and small steps um, and modeling. So breaking ideas out into small steps, private mo models and scaffolds. And finally, practice, the idea of practice. To get good at something, you need to do it again and again and again. And initially practicing it with guidance so that you're doing it right. And then uh, gradually weaning off the guidance so you're doing it more and more independently. So and that's, and that's it. So if you're an, an experienced teacher, you'll be thinking, yeah, well, that's what teaching is, isn't it? It's, it's um, sequencing concepts, modeling, scaffolding, questioning. And that's what I find is really helpful, that teachers recognize these strategies. So it's, it's not a case of, uh, do I do them? It's a case of, do, how well do I do them? What I find really interesting is that Rosenstein then connects it to the cognitive science. I'm just going to check some, some questions here. Yeah, that's great. Um, so it, it's not just observational it would it could be i mean i actually think rosenstein's principles works just as a simple account of this is what effective teachers seem to be doing and what they have in common but it's also linked to other work so i mentioned dan winningham's why don't students like school and this model that he he presents around a, a very simple architecture for a, mo a simplified model for how memory works and how learning happens is really useful and in our in my walkthroughs work we, we use this version of it, which is basically the same diagram. And I, and I, whenever I'm doing training with teachers, I spend time looking at this and saying, this is why Rosenstein's principles work. It's because learning has this sort of journey. You have to secure attention mentally. So you need to involve all your students thinking about the material in hand. So you need to have questioning techniques and checking for understanding techniques, which make then focus their attention and it tells you whether they are or not. You have to attend to the finite working memory problem. So there's only so many things students can process at any one time. So we have to break things down into small steps so that they can gradually assimilate that with what they already know. So you have to do some retrieval, hence the daily review. You have to, remember, you have to retrieve ideas that you already know and then make sense of things. 
in your working memory, which is where the modeling and scaffolding comes in. We need to sh help children to make the connections with what they already know and the new information. And then through that thinking process, which should involve all the students, they then make richer connections and their schema for an idea develops. And if we don't review weekly and monthly after that, we can start forgetting things. Even if we did make sense of things before, we can start to forget things. So we need to have all these routines. So nearly everything, well, I'd say all of the aspects of Rosenstein's principles can be explained using a, a nice simplif simplified memory model. And it's all about this idea of building. And the metaphor of building a schema is really useful. Gradually adding more, gradually deepening the connections, gradually making understanding richer and deeper. And, and, and I think if you read Dan Winningham alongside Barrett Rosenstein's principles, the two kind of support each other. And also helps us explain why sometimes students don't know things. So why might it be the case that a student doesn't understand what's happening? Well, it could be attention. It could be you know, distractions mentally, like it, just not focusing at the right moment when something's being explained and not following a line of reasoning so that although the teacher's explaining something, the student's not quite with them because their attention isn't quite focused enough. Or there are habits in a classroom where the, te the students learn that other children often do the, uh, do the thinking. And this is very common. It's very common to see lessons where students, are, the lessons are dominated by quite a small number of students. I see this re regularly where, you know, even if it's 10 students out of 25, they can dominate the discourse in a lesson and the other 15 are sort of silent in the room and you're hoping they're learning, but you can't be sure they are. And you, you can't even, they're not necessarily, they, they just assume that the other students typically do all the heavy lifting and thinking. And that can lead to all sorts of students drifting away. It could be they didn't know what you were talking about. Um, so the pro, you're assuming prior knowledge they just don't have. Um, my, favorite, my favorite example of that is a teacher trying to explain a famous part of, of English history, which is about Henry VIII. Uh, breaking away from the Catholic Church in 1533 and the teacher te telling the student about how Henry broke away from Rome because Rome implies the Catholic Church and the Pope, um, the base of the Pope in, in Rome. But the student didn't understand what break away from Rome meant. He didn't even realize that Protestants and Catholics were all Christians and that he had never heard of the Pope. So the teacher's explanation just was going over his head because he didn't know what was going on. And that's a sort of simple, that's a, just one of hundreds of examples where you assume students know things and they don't know them, so they don't know what's happening. And these other things are also an issue. So where students don't learn things, we can use this memory model to diagnose why and think, well, what, 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 what might be better for them? More fluency, more confidence building with repetition and recall making sure that the tasks are requiring them to think. It's very easy to, to perform tasks which we don't learn. So, you know, I could teach you now to fold a, a piece of paper into a shape of a boat. I could, I could make an origami boat and show you now, and you could all follow my steps and do it. It doesn't mean you've learned how to do it because you might not remember how to do it tomorrow or the next week. So just because you've done it doesn't mean you've learned how to do it because you were following my instructions every step. You can only really say you've learned how to do it if later on you could fold that paper into the boat without any help, because then you've, you've learned it. So task completion as a proxy for learning is an issue. So Rosentrand's principles sort of provides us solutions to the problems of learning. And that's why I think it's really powerful. It's recognizable. Teachers do them all the time. And it covers a lot of bases. So sometimes people say, isn't it a bit reductive? You know, there's more to teaching than this. And I say, well, yeah, there, there is. There's also things like, for example, reading, uh, practical tasks, students having to be independent learners and, and engaging in investigations and so on. And all of those things are useful, but a major core of most instructional programs is this. It's reviewing material, questioning, modeling and scaffolding and practice. And if you're not doing these things well, the other things you'd also like to do tend to be much shallower and less effective. So we all need to be good at instructional teaching, even whilst we recognize that it's not everything we do. 
So let's have a look at a couple more examples. So let's have a look at this, sequencing concepts and modeling. So many examples. One of my favorite ones is maths. So for example, in maths, how do we, how do we teach students to, to add fractions? Um, I, I've come across students in, in higher education or in further education, I should say, in England who are 16 years old, who have not passed our qualification at 16 at the required standard. There's about 30% of students who don't reach the standard at 16, and they can't necessarily do this question. A quarter plus two thirds. And you ask them the answer, they'll write three over seven, three sevenths. And you say, well, why is it three sevenths? And they'll just say, they'll shrug at you and say, I don't know, one plus two is three, four plus three is seven. And you say, well, how big is three sevenths? And they'll go, they'll look at you like, what do you mean? Like, well, three sevenths is a fraction. Well, how much of a, if I gave you three sevenths of a pizza, how much pizza would you have? And they look at me, go like, and have, they're not really, you realize they're not thinking like that. They're not thinking a quarter is a size of an object and two thirds is a bigger size of that object. And I'm adding them together. They're just seeing numbers on the page and going one plus two is three very mechanically. So for students who are not good at maths, very often, their fundamental schema, their home, their concrete home in, for the numbers is weak and they're not making those connections. So they can't see the issue with the answer being three over seven because it, it, it doesn't compute in the head as, a, as an entity which has any real meaning. And that means you've got to build schema securely. You've got to teach math so that those things are formed really well. So how do I make sure fractions have a home in something concrete? which then students can then, this is a pictorial representation of them, which then under, they, you understand a half is two quarters, is three sixths, is four eighths, is five tenths, just like that, because it just is, and we understand it and we see the connection and build on secure foundations. So a Rosenstein is very good on that. And of course, then we need to know the sequence all the way through how to then the procedures for, how would you build students' knowledge over time so they understand about lowest common multiples and common denominators and converting quarters and thirds into twelfths uh, so we get the idea that the pieces have to be the same size before we can add them. That kind of thinking needs thought about how you sequence the curriculum, the examples you'd use, and so on. And we could go into that in endless detail, but essentially that's what the basic idea is about. It also applies to things like models, when we're talking about models, conceptual models the models can be models of examples but it can be models of so ice water and steam how do i visualize what's happening i've seen teachers do this superbly well where they just literally get a glass of water and get children to just look at it and imagine the molecules in there and visualizing the behavior of the molecules and feeling ice on their hand and, and talking about how there's no such thing as cold there's only heat and heat leaves your hand and goes into the ice and they're feeling it happening and they're, they're trying to get a sense of heat flow in a concrete experiential sense to help them make sense of the abstract idea of heat coming in and out of, a, of an object and changing its state you can feel it happen you can see it happen it starts making sense and then try to explain that through uh, the models and you know, why does ice float on water? Because the molecular structure is more open, it's less dense, and I can visualize that and I can start understanding what I'm seeing. So this type of sequencing is really important and knowing which models to, to provide students with. And it's very important in writing. When children, the, the, this, these are pictures of children's writing from age five through to age 11 in a school, in one particular school. So age five up to age 11, writing, developing. Developing writing is a maturation process. So we get, we, we, don't, we don't move through the curriculum. We gradually mature in our, in our knowledge. We, it, it deepens and enriches and everything we, we learn makes what we've learned before make more and more sense. So we have to understand that sequence. And modeling is really important, showing how writing happens and what sorts of phrases to use is a big part of it. And scaffolding then means giving ch children techniques to use, which they, they borrow from the teacher. And then they gradually, they remember to use them on their own. So for example, learning to say, when you're comparing the advantages and disadvantages of something, you learn a structure such as on one hand, 
in English, this is how, in the English, this is the classic English thing. On one hand, the advantages are this, whereas on the other hand, the disadvantages are that. So on one hand and on the other hand, it's not a structure which you just happen to learn by accident. You, you get it shown, you get taught it, you get modeled how to use it. And then you get children practicing how to say on one hand and on the other hand, and then they're all trying to learn that. So there are lots of, lots of you know, thousands of examples of that. So knowing how we build writing through modeling and, and, and exemplification is, is so powerful. The next, the next thing that Rosenstein talks about is questioning. This is the meat of it. When you go into a lesson and you're observing a teacher, when you're observing this lesson, the interactivity is the most obvious part. And, 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 and what Rosenstein says is that teachers who spend more time questioning and checking for understanding get better outcomes in from what his study su suggested, rather than students, who, teachers who just sort of tell you things and don't check. Why? Because we need to know if the message is being received. Teaching isn't all about just one-way traffic. It's about the, le the learning happens in the students' heads. The learning doesn't happen in the air. Just because we've told students things doesn't mean they've learned it. And if we've got 30 students in a room, our responsibility is to ensure all of them have learned, not just be grateful that one person learned. So if I ask a question in the class and I say, what is seven cubed? And Michael puts his hand up and he says, seven cubed is 343. That just tells me Michael knows the answer. It doesn't tell me if anyone else knows the answer. And even if he explains his answer and he tells me how he worked out seven cubed, it doesn't mean anyone else knows how to explain it. I can't tell that by just because Michael did. And yet teachers make that assumption all the time that one student gives an answer and then they move on to another question, hoping that one person's answer will sort of permeate into the room. And very often it just doesn't happen. I test this out all the time. Nearly every time I visit a, a classroom, I'm, ask, I'm asking, a teacher asks a question, a student gives an answer and then you ask somebody else, did you understand that? What did you think? And very often they don't know the answer, even though it was just said, because it, learning doesn't just ping into your head. You need a chance to think, to explore. And if we're trying to make sure all children are learning, we need to be getting loops back to us to see how it's going. So how do we do that? How do we manage a classroom? Well, well we need a range of techniques. We need a whole set of techniques. And Rosenstein gives a few. These are my favorite techniques. Some are borrowed from Doug Mamold's Teach Like a Champion. Cold calling, no opt out. Let's check for understanding, probe and questioning. These are all types of questioning techniques that are useful. And in a, in a session of this length, I couldn't go into all of them one by one. But the main one is that Rosenstein stresses is this checking for understanding. And he's very, well, he's quite amusing about this. He says, how not to check for understanding is to say, have you understood? Teachers do this all the time. Think about, you know, it's, it's an, I saw a teacher recently who was teaching some seven-year-olds um, and she gave them instructions for a task. And she said, is that clear, everybody? Do you all understand what to do? And they all went, yes. And then they went off. And none of them understood it. Like they'd all, they all were confused immediately because they hadn't understood the task. But she had asked them, have you all, are you all happy? Do you all understand, know what to do? And they'd all said yes. But, but so they were wrong. And she, so she, rather than asking them to say, okay, so Abdi, tell me, what have I asked you to do? And Abdi might have tried to explain the task. It would have been obvious that he didn't know what to do. So getting students to tell you what they have understood is really the key to teaching, not just asking any problems, any questions, is everyone happy with that? And yet you watch as, le lessons, as many lessons as I do, you'll see this happens all the time. Teachers ask this on ineffective rhetorical question and it's worth thinking about. So we, checking for understanding is really important. So for example, well, I mean, that, that, that's, well, that's one of the, the obvious ones. And there are lots of other questioning techniques which we could go into. I'm just going to check the chat as it comes up because I, I want to make sure if there's a question that's current, I ask it straight away. Um, okay, no, it's just a thing there. So 
in, in amongst the other techniques, I suppose the other main one is, is cold calling. Now, cold calling is, has a name which comes from Doug Ramos, Teach Like a Champion. And really, it means that, that, that you could be asked to answer at any time. But there's a way of doing it, which is inclusive, which is, uh, and I've written a lot about this. And essentially, it means we don't have hands up and volunteers. Every student is ready to answer, ready to think. And we create an inclusive classroom by when you ask a class a question, any, everybody starts thinking because they could be asked. And so you have to give them time to think. And there's an accountability around that, which is whenever I ask a question, it might be you that I call on and it creates a higher ratio of students thinking and engaged. And it's a very, very powerful technique. Think pair share then gives everyone a chance to talk in their pairs. So a really good teacher will be getting students to talk in pairs and then talking by calling them, checking for understanding and it's weaving these techniques together. So the next part of Rose and Shine is reviewing material. You know, we've taught things, we've modeled it, we've questioned it. Now we have to check the students to remember things. And th this is the sort of thing where we get to the task completion. So let's say, for example, to give you an example, if, if I have some parts of the body labeled in my book, trachea, alveolus in my lungs, a bronchiole, a diaphragm underneath, if I have that labeled in my book, my text, my exercise book, does it mean I know it? Well, the answer is no, because you could have just seen it in the textbook, heard it being said, copied it down in your book. I only really could say I knew those words if I take that away and I have to generate them. And I'm now sort of seeing if I know them. So really knowing something means I can generate it. So I can say, that's the trachea, the function of the trachea is this, it's, it's got cartilage, it allows air to pass through into the lungs. This is the alveolus, the alveoli, there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of them in the lungs, they're air sacs. This is the bronchiole, this is a passageway, so on. So the name, the structure and function, if I can generate an explanation of that, that means I understand it. Simply having it written down in my book might be the start of that process, but it's not the process. So we need to test students. And of course, we might know it today. I might test you today and you might know that and you might say, yeah, trachea, alveolus, bronchial. But do you know it next week? Do you know it next month? So forgetting is so predictable. We've got to make sure that we're inter in interrupting forgetting and, and getting students to practice and rehearse to the point where they know those words really well. And new vocabulary is very, very uh, difficult to learn if you only encounter it a few times. You need to rehearse it, say it, so we need techniques which involve all students in re rehearsing language, practicing using it, and becoming confident and familiar with it, not just meeting it on one or two occasions. And there are other things like, you know, Macbeth, whether it's Macbeth quotes, if you want to be able to talk knowledgeably about Macbeth and um, how you, we know he was feeling guilt after killing M uh, M um, Duncan the King, in, in, the, in Shakespeare's Macbeth, knowing this quote, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife, and being able to recognize it and recognize where it comes from, what its significance is, being able to explain the, the symbolism of scorpions being an animal that generates, produces poison. So he's saying poison in my mind, he's sort of, and that's a, a, a kind of, the connotation of that is that he's feeling guilt, you know, racked with guilt. If you've seen the recent Macbeth film, he does this really well, full of, scorpions is my mind dear wife now for students who know that quote and are familiar with it they can make greater sense of the play um now it's not just a quiz to do um in 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 the bar one night it's not about just knowing knowledge for a quiz it's it's to deepen your own you're not your expert experience of understanding the play and the more elements of the knowledge that constitute understanding the play that you know and you're familiar with is the richer your knowledge is so we need to build a repertoire of elements of knowledge which students are, are familiar with and so they can build confidence. And that means things like knowing some quotes is quite useful. And that requires a level of repetition and practice. And that's, that's very, that can be very supportive. Things like this, you know, tell the story. Why does it rain? You know, why do we have clouds? Um, and, and explaining all sorts of issues with weather patterns and climate change. And, uh, can, a, can you explain that? Now, we don't just quiz on that. I and mean, sometimes narratives are useful. And Rosenshine alludes to this, as does um, Dan Willingham, that 
narrative structures help us remember things. So it's not just what are the facts about the water cycle, it's can I tell the story and what would happen if this and what would happen if that. So here's some key words which I can use to tell the story. Evaporation happens. Why does evaporation happen? Because the, the sun, the sun's energy through radiation um, warms the warms the sea and that leads to molecules so we can explain all of that we've got some knowledge and understanding so there's a lot going in there isn't there but to get to the point where students can tell the story of the water cycle you've got to sequence it in a, in steps and it's not just a series of disconnected facts it's a series of connected facts which you can link through a story structure and with the, the great thing about the cycle is you don't doesn't doesn't really matter where you start you can start anywhere and tell the story and we can explain it in, in like like a, like a soap opera you know what would happen if this happened and why did that happen and if that changed what would happen to this and cause and effect come into it so this is a really good sort of frame framing of retrieval that we're telling stories and we're remembering stories and stories help us connect ideas and nearly everything we learn in the curriculum can be framed in a narrative of some kind. And then last of all, practice. Now this is something which gets underplayed. We don't get good at anything without practice. We practice the piano, we practice playing football, we practice speaking another language. And we then have to then get students to do things well. So we need to think of the things which, which students are going to practice. So for example, if I was gonna teach you to throw the javelin, I can't just encourage you to do well. I can't just say, come on, Jason, throw the javelin. Throw harder, throw better. You know, what does that mean? You need to analyze the technique and say, well, this is, this is what you need to do. Practice doing this. It could be the run up, the, the force of the throw, the angle. And you analyze the technique and you say, work hard on this. So mindset sorts of things saying, don't give up till you, don't give up, Jason. Every mistake is progress. So he's thinking, no, it isn't. <laughs> Every mistake isn't progress. Every mis progress is progress. And Dave, Jason doesn't feel good about throwing the javelin until he throws it further. And it's the same with adding fractions. You can't make children feel better about themselves by saying, oh, don't worry, it's fine. Making lots of mistakes is all good. Unless eventually they learn not to make the mistakes because they get and they feel better. And children's self-esteem is built on success. It's not built on sympathy for failure. And we have to understand that. That's literally how, how things work. So Rosenstein is good at this. He's saying, break it down into small steps and give the students loads of guided practice and their self-esteem will go up. And that's how we need to be teaching. It's all about high success rate. And Rosenstein says about 80% success is the optimum. If children are mostly making mistakes, they're practicing getting it wrong and their self-esteem drops and they start thinking, I'm not very good at this. And that's not very helpful. So we need to break things down. So if you're talking about football, trap and pass, trap and pass, there's lots of specific elements to football which make up the match. We need to deconstruct our, our curriculum into practicable elements. What can you do over and over again, over and over again? So in, in writing, it could be sentences like throughout the poem, at first glance, both, however, whereas these are practicable. It could be practicing explaining something. Like, I, can I practice explaining how a wind farm works? Well, here, here's a table of advantages and disadvantages. Which ones do you remember? Okay, see if you can explain. On one hand, on one hand, an advantage of a wind farm is, but on the other hand, a disadvantage is, boom. Like, did I get it right? Let me check. And the students can learn to check themselves. Like, have, an, have another go, practice it more. Try, try to add a few more things. Okay, yeah, so. Two advantages of wind farms are, uh, whereas some disadvantages are, so I'm saying on one hand or whereas, and I'm practicing, I'm thinking, I'm getting better at explaining it. So you, there's lots of things you can practice. So practice means implies some repetition with feedback to get better and better and better and better and more confident and more fluent. And then less and less support from the teacher. So I'm doing it on my own. It's a really simple and, and a great flow that Rosenstein's captured there. Guide the practice, get them to do it right, high success rate, and then gradually make them do it on their own.
And if we're getting that right, then we're really teaching. So that's what's happening in the classroom. Teachers trying to do all of those things. So I anyway, just pause for a moment because I will talk tell you about the walkthroughs, but just from the chat there, I mean, that we won't be able to take lots of questions, but from all of those techniques, and I can, I can show the, the slide with all of them, you might just have a look at that and say, which of those things do you think I might work on? So if I'm gonna improve my practice, I'm doing all of those things a bit already, but I could get better at all of those things. In fact, I'd say I've never met a single teacher who couldn't improve those things because we can all review material more effectively. We can all question more effectively. We can all model and scaffold more subtly, very much so. Just as a flavor, what sorts of things do you think you see or that you're thinking of are big issues for you when you're teaching or you're observing teaching? Has anyone got any, any suggestions in the chat? <laughs> 